button anymore and that's it. And I don't think about you recording until we are, until you are sharing and I don't see the little red button. Right, none of us do. Yeah. Okay, so Ruth Benedict is being an objective observer. She's picked four examples from other cultures that provide alternatives to American culture. They also contradict traditional American values, homosexuality, mystic trance, what we would call paranoia about our yam seeds, and then what we would call um, murder, <laughs> right? Headhunting. All right. What does she think you can learn? People are molded by their norms. Western values are no better. If we lived there, we'd have the values. If we had these values, our personalities would be different, except for some basic introvert, extrovert genetic stuff. There's no reason for cultural selection. Morality means normality. That's it. All that means is what's ever normal is what makes people comfortable and they call it moral. What is she against? Bigotry, right? A false sense of the inevitability of our American Western values. Why does she think it's harmful? Well, Westerners have used this. It's major. We go out there in our colonialism and we use our cultural values as a bludgeon to try and tell everybody else they're inferior and try to force them into our way of living. Does she have a non-relative value? Yes, she thinks tolerance is better than bigotry. Um, her research is going to improve the human condition by making Westerners aware of their unjustified bias. Uh, she's gonna take away our arrogance and our ignorance and our bigotry. Scientific investigation of other cultures and telling the whole truth, telling the facts will improve our society and prejudice is bad. What are the universal problems that every culture deals with? Food, clothing, shelter, sexuality, family life, raising children, aging, health, death, grief, education, the arts, religious expression, distribution of wealth, criminality, anger, jealousy, revenge, pride, greed, sloth. Lots of things that every society has to deal with in some way. What are the specific problems uh, to which myst these things are a response, okay? Mystic trance is a response to what is acceptable religious expression, so uh, public religious expression. Homosexuality is sexuality, obviously. Paranoia is what is acceptable in relation to our need for food. And headhunting is what is acceptable as an expression of your grief. Um, are these specific norms entirely non-rational and subconscious, or is there a reason behind them, right? She says there's no reason, they're arbitrary. And I'm saying there is a reason. India's trance uh, gives people inner strength in the face of poverty, war, and tribal exchanges, people from different tribes going back and forth. Instead of having wars and threatening, uh, mystic trance keeps people peaceful. Greece and Native Americans is that they live on small islands. They live in places where too many people is a problem. So if the stability of the culture requires not having a lot of people, then if you have a sexual orientation that's not gonna lead to procreation, then you're okay, right? That's gonna be socially acceptable. Whereas in America, the idea was taming the frontier. You needed a lot of kids to run your farm, to get a bigger farm, to get more productive. So homosexuality would be not acceptable because it's not related to the way the society perceives its survival. Um, paranoia, that was a custom that they had developed to maintain their yam seeds. It might not have had to have that much paranoia, but it worked, okay? And then headhunting was, um, 
this the tribes required the chief there was one chief who had the power and told them what to do well they had to believe that their chief was all powerful and when his family members got killed that made it look like he doesn't control everything and so he had to reaffirm that he's in control and so you could explain that custom as his way of reaffirming his power and so that the tribe would stay obedient to him and it would stay unified right yeah, i'm glad you explained that because i did not understand her use of that as an example um she was talking about death or like, like how how to oh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna remember exactly what but it was how to face face death as a society you know where the chief wakes up and his wife and daughter are gone or something he's like well who's gonna cry are we gonna cry about it or are we gonna go do whatever and they find a sleeping family of children and kill them and then they all feel better and i was like well what does that have to do with anything but now that you're talking it doesn't have like what does that have to do with grief uh, you know what does that have to do with facing death nothing but it does have something to do with control so yeah the thing is she she never talks like this she yeah. doesn't say that there's a reason as a matter of fact she says there's no reason it's entirely arbitrary that's really important okay do you guys understand that that you really do have to find a reason and it's about survival it's about cultural adaptation but but and this is standard stuff in academia and again i i have no idea on the lion college campus but i want you to understand how many college professors preached this doctrine of relativism and and religion is just entirely relative the word god is a social construct it's made up to control people right uh and that's where you get this humanist versus religion this anti-religious humanism and this pro-religious whatever i mean these false dichotomies are based on academics who have really false limited opinions about reality but it goes back to their social science they're just being objective observers they're just looking at the facts okay um there's certain temperament types that one guy was cheerful in spite of the head of the yams everybody else is paranoid and they sort of thought he was funny um is the purpose what's the purpose of a society this is really important. Is it to meet human needs and realize human potential? Or is the purpose to mold people into conformity for the sake of survival, right? Adaptation or some combination? Very important question. What is a good society? According to Benedict, well integrated and consistent with itself. So according to Benedict, the purpose of the society is to mold people into conformity, right? So that it's well integrated and consistent. Um, what is her conclusion? Morality differs and is a convenient term for socially approved. There's no reason. I just completely disagree with that. The process is non-rational and unconscious. Well, for most people it is, and it stays non-rational and unconscious. The reason you go to college is to move that from non-rational and unconscious to rational and conscious. You're capable of changing the foundation of your thinking when you are college age, okay? Now, Benedict and all the other professors of this ilk would say, yeah, you, you have to go from thinking what you were born with is true to just realizing that nothing's true and everybody has a different point of view, right? What does she think is real? Social groups, empirical data about group behavior. How does the human mind think? Okay, this is a philosopher speaking. According to her, how does the mind think? We observe things and we make generalizations. What sort of non-inductive thinking does she think is impossible? And that's every, 
a lot of the stuff we've read, right? Aristotle's theory of virtues is based on a view of human nature. It's not based on facts. Most societies do not cultivate the virtues, but that doesn't mean they aren't there and it doesn't mean you're not supposed to. Augustine, free will. Uh, we, we have an eternal soul, right? The goal of life is salvation or damnation. Sure. Benedict I is completely... Um, Benedict is uh, right. All, she completely rejects that. It's a blank slate. So Aristotle does not have a blank slate view. It's a naturalistic view, but it's not blank slate. Augustine has this supernatural, we're born in the image of God, immortal soul view, totally the opposite of blank slate. Then you have Aquinas that unified those two. And um, that is incompatible with Benedict. Then you had Kant that we naturally have this a priori reasoning where we make everything into a set of laws. Benedict is blank slate. Locke said he was blank slate, but then he said we're born free and equal, which has nothing to do with people. I mean, you don't observe that. You don't observe freedom or equality when you're studying social groups. What sort of inductive thinking does, does Benedict reject? And that was John Stuart Mill's view of higher and lower pleasures. He said it's an empirical fact that people who are exposed to both choose the higher pleasures. She would say, you're not observing groups, right? This has nothing to do with my work as an anthropologist where I study social groups. You're just projecting your Victorian privileged male British Victorian psyche onto everything. How does her conclusion that everything is just a Morality is a convenient term for socially approved habits. How does that follow from her view of reality and the way the mind thinks? In questions of good and evil, justice and injustice, people can only describe their own experience in a social group. That's all they can do. Socialization means they're born into groups, they observe what's going on and they adapt to it. If she's correct, what characters in uh, number six, if she's correct that this is all people can do and that the reason we have these other views is just because you were, it was socially acceptable to say all that stuff, right? And you were socially conditioned to act on this certain set of words. It's not because they actually refer to anything. It was just your way of being socialized, that's it. Um, if she's right in number six, what characteristics must the best societies possess and why? Well, they select a set of traits that reinforce each other. They maintain those same traits from one, value, from one generation to the next, and they're coherent and consistent, and everyone is comfortable with it, and nobody questions it. Does everybody understand that? Anybody have any questions about if, if you're really making her hold her feet to the fire and say, okay, this is what you're doing. Does that make sense? Yeah, because when yeah, I, okay. what? Oh, when I, when I was reflecting on it, I put that it really reminded me of the, uh, Darwinian natural selection. Yes. Which, and I mean, Darwinism got to the point where that was the only possible solution. That was the only thing people thought about. So everything was described and explained through evolution, the theory of evolution. Um, like it, it just monopolized. Well, search and study during its time, but also it got it got turned into reductionism. What yeah. happened is it got turned into what's called social Darwinism was the survival of the fittest. Yeah, it and changed it was, the way everybody very few, thought. What? It changed the way everybody thought. 
about life. But Darwin didn't agree with social Darwinism. No. Okay. Or else if he did, th there's nothing in evolution that would that would actually contradict. So social Darwinism is that the the owners of these industries are the ones that have adapted and fit and moved on. And so they they will survive. And then the workers, if they don't adapt, too bad, you know, they're going to die out. And so the trouble with that is the owners have children and grandchildren that inherit their stuff and that aren't adapting, you know, so the whole thing gets corrupt. The other thing is Darwin thought that in the future, you would have women's equality, you would have social evolution, right? Women's equality, racial equality, international. Um, so he wasn't <coughs> a social Darwinist in that sense. Okay, I mean it's it's more complicated than that. Except that in the long run, um, Darwin did not just think that the best thing is is for a society to just stay the same way all the time. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I, mean, I just kind of felt like yeah. the direction she was going made it seem like society was the living, breathing right, that's right. thing as opposed to the individual people that make up the society. Right, that's what I'm saying in question seven. Yeah. The best society it selects traits that enforce each other. It maintains the same values in one generation. It's coherent and internally consistent. So you had those little societies on the islands, right? And everybody's comfortable and there's no problem, right? Now you have to keep this in mind because she herself is the devil on this point of view, right? She does exactly the opposite of this in relation to her own society. Okay, if she's right, what will destroy a society? Change, right? Interaction with other groups. Ah, you know, uh, introducing new behaviors so that the experience of the new generation is unintelligible to the elders, right? Terrible thing to do. Introducing behaviors which conflict with traditional beliefs. You're destroying the society, right? So the new generation has to reject the old people, introduce them without calling them morally better. In other words, grandma and grandpa, I just want to be different. So screw you, right? It's no different. It's no better. That would destroy, right? Absolutely destroy a coherent society. Does that make sense? Does everybody understand that? Well. To me, I mean, that would destroy an indigenous culture or tradition, maybe, but I, it wouldn't destroy a society. Well, let's go to the next step. This is exactly what she just did to Westerners, right? right. Given her view, if she really wanted to strengthen Western society, her society, right, what would she say? She'd go there and she'd come back and she'd say, ah, there are a bunch of barbarians. We're so superior to them. And now I know because I have all this data and um, aren't we aren't, I am so glad I was born in America because this just reinforces the values that I grew up with, right? Does that make sense? If she wanted to keep our society internally consistent with itself, she would use her research to demonize these other views. But that's not what she does. She does the opposite. If she wanted to weaken American society, what would she do? She'd force us to recognize other cultures are different, but they're equally valuable. People are plastic. They can be molded any way. This, okay, so get over your bigotry. Nothing you ever thought was good is really good. Nothing you ever thought was just is really just. Um, she's undermining our cultural integrity. And that's what the Jerry Falwells 
and the right-wing conservative fundamentalists say about these relativists, right? They're undermining Western society. Um, what does she think she's doing? She's getting rid of Western bigotry, domination and imperialism. But on her own view, what is she doing? She's destroying Western society, right? If she's right, if we can't get past our empirical generalizations, then societies are either chaotic because everyone lives differently or, um, or else whatever most people do is what's morally right, right? You do anything you want. Um, all right, so, you know, you can say, well, I learned, I grew up um, where you had to beat people up in order to get respect. So I, you know, that's what I think is right. Somebody else, I grew up being told you have to treat other people like you want to be treated, the golden rule. Okay, whatever floats your boat. <laughs> but the trouble is, then you don't have any coherence at all in a society, right? So if everything is relative and you beat that in your head, you have no coherence at all in a society. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Anybody else want to comment on that? It took me forever to figure out what has always bothered me about relativism. And if you want to put it in a nutshell, it does have a cultural superiority complex built into it. Uh -huh. Because when, when a professor comes and tells students, I'm going to rid you of your bigotry, they're expecting you to think critically. They're expecting a higher level of thought. And they don't expect it of these island communities. Well, that's paternalistic. Like, are they not capable of it? Um, but on the other hand, then they don't, they, they undermine any coherence in the students' minds or lives. And that is a lie, right? We do have a common humanity. And so that blank slate eliminates any common humanity. And so, so that's where we're getting to with the slavery thing. To call that relative is just grotesque. So if you're a moral relativist, you can say, well, slavery used to be socially acceptable, right? And so this, this outline is why more, another reason moral relativism is wrong. Like slavery is wrong. I'm sorry, <laughs> right? It's and sexism is wrong. Greed is evil. Destruction of the natural world without any concern for the future is wrong. It's evil. <laughs> you know, there is a natural foundation for life. Um, societies can't mold people to be what they're not, no matter how severe the conditioning, the rewards and the punishments. Uh, people will never be inferior or superior based on gender or race, no matter how much you try to beat it into them. Um, whites do not deserve the power over slaves that they have. It's, um, it's always implicitly recognized. So if you read Frederick Douglass, um, this is the outline that I'm going to do, but I do want well, why don't I just ask you, what was your first reaction when you read Frederick Douglass excerpts? Honestly, Dr. Beck, I haven't made it that far. That's okay. That's I'm sorry. <laughs> it doesn't matter. What about me, you, Warren? Um, for me, I got, I got some ways down, <clears throat> down the outline and I'm searching right now for the part that I was gonna comment on, but basically it was the overview of, of what I was gonna comment on is how they wanted the slave. It's almost as if they wanted, they said they wanted the perfect slave is one that um, is not able to reason, not able to think or question anything. And then 
Let me see if I can find it. Well, did uh, you read the original text? The original text? Because um, I had some excerpts there. Which one? The one that says Frederick Douglass? Um, what's it? Excerpts. I didn't get all the way into that one. Okay. Okay. So I did run through the outline pretty detailed and I made some notes, but it's so just go ahead. Go ahead. Where did you get? Yeah. It's just baffling to me how they like I had the idea that that's how they treated people, but to literally see it in writing to say, okay, this is what they want is really baffling to me because. They're basically looking at the slaves as not people, but as just mindless things that they want to work. They don't want them to be able to think. They don't even want them to be able to, because most of the slaves were illiterate. They couldn't read. They don't want them to have any understanding of what exactly is going on around them or any understanding of injustice. And I saw somewhere in the outline where it says, um, the slaves didn't necessarily question or complain about the injustice entirely. They spoke about the specifics of the injustice, like the type of injustice, which to me is basically saying to me, they're in a state of learned helplessness that, okay, this is a state that we're, we're gonna be in and there's nothing we can do about it. So we're just gonna complain about the type of injustice and not injustice itself. Yeah, learned helplessness is, is you know, it's it's a leftover from that, right? It's a milder form, right? Yeah, well, the other thing about it, Warren, just think. The fact that um, Sophia Ald's husband, remember, she started teaching him how to read. She yes. had a kid the same age as Frederick Douglass. And so mm -hmm. they hired him to be kind of a companion. And she started teaching him to read. And her husband said, don't do that, right? That'll make them. Okay, so Frederick Douglass's story is about how the capacity for reason was his guiding star. He was determined <laughs> to learn to read, and that was what got him out, right? Whereas Sojourner Truth, it's her idea of God that got her out. And so I think, I think those are two kind of interesting paradigms. Because I have students for whom rejecting all the anti-intellectual religion and going with reason has been their path out, right? But I have students for whom a critical idea of God, right? Rejecting the standard, but being determined to think, I think God wants me to use my mind, is their path out, right? So we still have those two sort of archetypes. Um, but the other thing was, if slaves really were by nature inferior, if they really were, you could try to teach them to read and they wouldn't learn. Exactly. They're not capable, right? I think what happened was that the slave masters, they really thought of, of them as people who can be of threats, but they wanted to, to make it their job to belittle them, to be like, okay, this is where you are and we are here and you're never able to move to here. So I think in a sense, it's kind of funny that they're putting these things into place as a form of respect for the slave because they're saying, okay, they do see them as people, but we wanna make sure that they don't see themselves as people. Right, in other words, he knew that the slave had the capabilities. Mm -hmm. He has the same capabilities as white people. He can yes. learn to read. Mm -hmm. And so it has to be forced. So he knew it was unjust. Yeah, right? I, found, I found the thing, that, the, the statement that I was looking for, it says, to make a contented slave, it is necessary to make a thoughtless one. It is necessary to darken his moral and mental vision and as far as possible to annihilate the power of reason. He must be able to detect no inconsistencies in slavery. He must be able to feel that slavery is right and he can be brought to that only when he ceases to be a man. Well, think of a Ruth Benedict. I mean, on her view, as long as everybody was in agreement with it, was internally consistent, everybody agreed, slavery was fine, right? 
It was those stupid abolitionists that really undermined the coherence of the South. There still are people like that who think of that. Course. I there's I have students' grandparents who want the good old days of Jim Crow because everybody had a place and everybody knew their place and it was a lot more stable, right? But what can what can Ruth Benedict say about that? She doesn't have an answer to that. And that's that's like horrifying to think a college professor wouldn't have an answer to that. I, I would say that the example just goes to show that there's no way she's correct. If you think about the slavery component of the Civil War, where the South was unwilling to relinquish their slaves. Everybody in the Southern culture, that was their way of life, okay? If they got rid of the slaves, who's going to work to build? How are we going to make money? Yada, yada, yada. I know. And since everybody believed that it's okay, they went to war with the other half of the nation that didn't believe it was okay. The, the ones who were willing to say, well, yeah, they helped me make money. They helped me make a living, but it's still wrong. Okay, so if Benedict was right, our society would have never fractured. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Well, then there's Karl Marx's interpretation, which is in the North, the, the money source was more industrial based and they didn't need right. slaves. Right. And so it was really all about money. Right. The southern economy versus the northern economy. And so when the, when the former slaves came north, they, they still didn't give them equality in housing, right? They didn't want slaves, but they want these un, underemployed, underpaid workers living in crappy housing. Right. <laughs> you know, So I think the northerners are just as racist as the southerners. They just covered up better. Uh, right with money or they have a different economic system but they still have mistreated African Americans um, but anyway I as long as you sort of understand because this to me this is mentally hard to get wrapped your head wrapped around but it's so obvious it's like it's in front of your face and you just have to figure out how to think it through right until it because, because that idea that you look at stuff and everybody's different and morality is just a socially approved habit, you know, it, it's powerful, but it's wrong. And it's so obviously wrong. And it covers up things like slavery. Um, Ivy, did you have a, a reaction to the reading by Douglas? Um. Yeah, I was completely basically just agreeing with what you guys were saying. I um, think that they did get molded to, well, everything has molded us to a point where um, we're kind of blinded by the reality, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, and it's kind of hard to know, to step back and know like what's real. It is. Um, so yeah, I was kind of basically agreeing with all that uh, Warren was saying. Sorry. Right. And it, because in order to have a just society, in order to have a society that is structured according to the truth, you my shoes? there had to be women and uh, African-Americans that just in an act of faith, or radical intuition said, we are not intellectually inferior. We are not more emotional than that. We are not. I don't care how much data you give me. It's not natural. This is unnatural conditioning. This is pervasive conditioning. John Stuart Mill talked about that, but it's still unnatural. We're not a blank slate and we're not by nature inferior. But that's what Warren was picking up with that quote from Sophia Ald's husband. I can't remember his name. 
when he said, don't teach a, a black kid to learn to read because then they'll be uppity. He knew, right, that they're capable of it. So yeah, and he, I also um, understood what they were saying when they were talking about how you're molded into oppression because there's a lot where um, you would want to stand out and be like, hey, that's not right. You know, we're human too. But then who do you complain to? You, it, you're you just going to get sent right back to the people who are your abusers. And at that point, um, when the, ab what is it? Abolish, I can't pronounce words. Abolitionist. Came back around. Abolitionist, ab abolitionist thank you. Um, came around, a lot of p uh, slaves didn't really want to go out at first and you know take that chance because they were like well what am I going to do you know this is all that I've known this is I don't I you know they can't really function and so it was the people who kind of stood they kind of thought about it and they were like this might not be right that took that chance and changed slavery <laughs> Yeah, and then there, and then legislators would vote these reactionary laws because they got votes, because slaves didn't have an equal vote. Oh my God. Yeah, so it's a slow process. It's just that you see the same patterns. But the foundation of it is that we all have equal capabilities. Our natural capabilities are not connected to our racial characteristics or our gender characteristics or our sexual orientation characteristics, okay? So we all have the same abilities and a good society. This is the next question. What's a good society? Well, I think it's one that's structured to give people opportunities to develop their capabilities so they can flourish. But that is going to mean a certain amount of instability and not chaos, but not obsession with order and things like the good old days, right? Because if you want to be able to meet people's capabilities, you're, you're going to have to be improving your society all the time, providing more and more people with more and more opportunity. You're going to have to be adapting to whatever changes there are in the economic system. You're going to have to be adapting to whatever changes there are in the power dynamic, right? China is going to rise. What are we going to do about it, right? Well, I think we should figure out how to make things that they would buy instead of bombing them, right? <laughs> it's just like bombing them doesn't solve anything, you know? Just figure out how to compete with them economically, how to make stuff they need. But, you know, anyway, I mean, those are all the things that you've got to constantly be questioning and always with a view to providing a stable middle class, always with a view to enable people to flourish. Um, but you can disagree with me. Um, I'll just go with that at the moment and then I'll whip through a little bit of this and we're going to have to pick up on this for Friday. We'll finish this and we'll go to the next lesson, which was, oh no, that's, I think this is it for today and Friday. So that's, that's good. I'm glad we just have two lectures in three days because it works better. Um, we started, I think with Freud after spring break, but anyway, so slavery is a corrupting, look, think about how corrupting this is. If you just step back, look, mothers and babies need each other and to separate them from birth. I mean, just think they would be put on the chopping block, right? The selling block and you'd separate with mothers from their kids. And come on, is nobody's gonna get conditioned to that nobody's going to be able to be well integrated with itself that's just a horrible if your conscience can live with that you have trouble with you i mean your consciousness is corrupted you have lost any sense of identifying with other people as human beings 
even at the level of mother and child, you know, he didn't see his mother. These people didn't know who their mothers were. They didn't know who their brothers and sisters were. Um, marriage, it completely corrupts <clears throat> this desire, this need for the parents of children to stay together and provide a stable environment. Uh, it can be an extended family, but this just destroyed everything. And so we still have issues with the African-American family structure. Well, they're more like a tribe for one thing. And they're, but I mean, look what we did to their families for hundreds of years, you know? That doesn't, those wounds do not heal quickly because they're so deep. So- I, have, I wanna, can I say something real quick? Sure. It's a little bit off topic, but I'm really interested in families and how they work and the child parent relationship. And I have noticed in black families and Hispanic families um, and somewhat somewhat in the Asian families, but it, there, it's a different, there's still something different than what I'm trying to say here. Hispanic parents and black parents seem to, and I don't have any data to refer to, I don't have any statistics or anything, their children are more respectful. Their children are, for the most part, better behaved. And it may be because, you know, they still have ties to their roots that have not been like destroyed by being part of America or because we have alienated them by slavery or immigration laws or whatever. So they had to, you know, that they had to cling to that to, to stay who they were or to, to stay who they are, you know, in order to just to keep going to survive. Well, actually, I'm sure, Alicia, there are studies done on these things. Yeah. Because I really think the African-American history of the family is so radically different from any other immigrant group. Okay, so uh, Latino people have always had extended family, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, of course, some of them, when they immigrated, they lost their families. Yeah. So... Another issue is that America was a country where people left their families and came, right? Yeah. So compared to any other historical country, we have a more broken family structure. Does that make sense? We don't have an extended family history. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And in the case of slavery, we broke families apart. And in the case of Hispanic immigrants, they immigrated for their families, you right. know, instead of leaving their families behind. Right. And and that's, I think that's a big part of what's wrong with our society, our culture right now, is that the family structure is, I mean, that's what every other social structure is informed by, and it is the weakest structure in our society. Right, I mean, it is, it's very dysfunctional yeah. because I think what's natural is an extended family so that kids grow up around cousins, aunts, uncles, <laughs> grandparents yeah. that they see often enough so that they can eventually understand their character and they learn character development. They learn character. They learn a lot about human character. Yeah. But the US, and look at our ideology, look at John Locke, the right, right to freedom, right to equality. That's so abstract. It just totally you know, has nothing to do with families or relationships, but it's the foundation for the way our economy works. So not only did we move here for economic opportunity, but the corporation will move you anywhere, right? There's no roots. They just expect you to be uprooted 
And then again, in order to make money, the iPhones, every interruption within the family, TV, all that stuff pulled away from simply being in the presence of a family member, right? Just reading a book or making cookies or something where your mind and their mind are together. This is what we don't have. And you make a whole lot of money on people who are compensating for the fact that they don't have stable relationships, right? Then they have to buy stuff. They have to prove to somebody else that they're pretty enough or that they're rich enough. Or... So just there's a whole lot of things about America that have really uh, made trouble for the mother-child bond, the family bond, the extended family. Anyway, we'll leave it there. But slavery, you know, to, to put a woman and her baby up on a chopping block and sell them both as property is about as low as you can go, right? Yeah. Okay, I'll let you guys go. Thank you so much. Next time, we'll start with your comments and we will have time to go through this. And I hope you process all of this. I think it's all really important. And I do think you think so too. So that's kind of nice. Yeah. All right. We'll see you. Bye. Bye-bye.